I have long admired those who were able and who have been Boy Scouts. I have a, a nephew who's an Eagle Scout, and I know that we have some who have grown up in that program and have done much good for many people. Um, I never did. I was busy doing other things and uh, wish that I had. I wish I'd spent more time in it. That's a lifestyle. It is a, a commitment. It teaches values that I think are very important for a young man to have and growing up and learning to be a leader in his family and in his community. I think the Boy Scouts does a good job of that, but in recent years we know the Boy Scouts has changed in some of their uh, ideals and some of the things that are supported, some of their stances on homosexuality, and that's regretful. Uh, but there are, as a result, emerging some alternatives to the Boy Scouts, which might be just as good and teach the same kinds of things, but be more Christ-centered. And so if you have young boys in that age, that might be something to look into. It's something I'm certainly going to consider. But we know that the Boy Scouts have long stood for good, solid moral principles. In fact, their oath says, on my honor, I ought to get Luke to come up here and quote it. Can you quote it? I'm sure he can. Says he can. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the scout law to help other people at all times to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. It's that last one that we question now about the Boy Scouts. But still, they're doing good. They're teaching boys how to uh, help, how to be involved in their community and to be helpful in the lives of those around them. The picture that we see there is one we often think of, a Boy Scout helping someone across the street. Helpfulness is a basic, foundational part of goodness, of Christianity, of any form of morality, helpfulness. Helping other people do basic, simple things is just a common sense part of any system of morality. That's, that almost goes without saying. But we understand as we grow older, as we have children, as we get involved in work and other things, it is easy, it can happen, that we get so absorbed in our own activities, in our own goings-on, in our own lives, and in our own commitments that we forget to look for those opportunities to do these basic, simple acts of helpfulness to those around us. I'm talking about things like holding the door for someone. And I know that may not be socially acceptable by some even today. Uh, that's looked at as an act of the patriarchy. But we're still going to do it, aren't we? As gentlemen, holding the door for someone, helping with groceries, picking up litter, returning our carts to the cart return in the parking lot at Walmart, whatever you call that thing. These are just basic, simple acts that can be helpful. It, it requires some thought, though. It requires an observation of, uh, of the needs, of things that other people may not see or may not be doing. It requires thoughtfulness. When I was in high school, I, I may have been doing it for the wrong reason. I feel like now when I look back that my intentions were good and sincere, and I just wanted people to know what a good person could be. There weren't any other Christians in the high school that I attended besides me and my sisters. And so I wanted to set an example. And I would, in between classes, we had the periods. We had seven periods. I would find girls that I knew and carry their books to them to the classes that we had together. And I would, I would have as many books as I could carry. Now, I say... In my heart, in my mind, I was doing that for the right reasons. But it didn't hurt that the girls liked it too. So, But I was trying to be helpful. And that's just something that it seems like when we think about the life of Jesus Christ, that could be the most basic explanation of what He did while He was on this earth. He helped people. When you look at the times the word help is used, especially in the gospel accounts in the New Testament, it is often a people coming to Jesus and saying, I need your help. Help me. That's exactly what Jesus did. He came to this earth to help people. Whether it was spiritually 
He helped with their spiritual needs. He gave them what they needed. He gave them that living water. He gave His blood for us so our sins could be washed away. Or whether it was physically, He would heal people, heal their diseases, heal their sicknesses, heal their wounds. He would heal the, the, the deaf and the dumb and the blind. Jesus came to, lie, to earth to help. And so the most basic explanation of what Christianity is, is being helpful. It's helping those who are in need. And maybe sometimes this is such a simple concept that we forget about it. We overlook it. We just go about our lives totally absorbed in what we're doing and what our families are doing and we forget to be helpful. And so I hope tonight that this is a reminder of how to be helpful, of what we can do to help one another and who we should be helping as well. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28 says... This is the English Standard Version. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. These are some of the spiritual gifts, some of the miraculous abilities bestowed by the Holy Spirit in the first century. While the New Testament was being written through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit... God gave these abilities to men, to people in the church in the first century that was passed on through the laying on of the apostles' hands to confirm the word that was being revealed by the Holy Spirit. The apostles had all spiritual gifts. And the list here in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, really, I believe, in Paul's mind, is in order of desirability, order of things that if we coveted after and that's what he deals with there in that context if we coveted after a gift this is the order of the gifts that we should covet them the apostles had all spiritual gifts and Paul often gives emphasis then to the importance to the uh, primacy of prophecy in the rank of spiritual gifts after that the ability to speak the truth the ability to be part of the revelation of God's will that's what he means by prophets. And then third, teachers, those who are miraculously endowed with the ability to teach the gospel to others. Then miracles, gifts of healing, and helping was a gift bestowed upon the first century church as the New Testament was being revealed as a form of miraculous endowment. The ability, the miraculous ability to be helpful. This word in the Greek is antilepsis. It's the prefix anti and then the, the root word lepsis or lambano. And the word anti, that prefix anti, we often think of as against or opposite to. But in this case, it's, it's used more in a locational sense. In this case, that prefix anti means in front of, which if you think about it is kind of uh, against or opposite. If one person's going one direction and another person in front of them, they're, they're facing opposite directions. They may be opposite of one another. And so it, it fits there. But in this word, it's more of a locational description and it means in front of. And that word lepsis or lambano means to lay hold of or to support or for the purpose of supporting. And so this word help or helping in the English standard in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 literally means to support from the front. To support from the front. The picture that we get is of a person on the Christian journey who's daily walking, doing the best that he or she can and is at the point of near collapse. Maybe exhausted from the effort that they've been exerting. How how much they've been trying to do for others, how, how much good works they've been involved in, and now they need help. They need supporting from the front. And a brother or a sister comes and supports them, holds them up from the front, maybe even to the point of letting them ride on their back, carrying them on their backs. This is what the word help, helping here in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28 means. But this is in a miraculous context. And if these were miraculous gifts given by the Holy Spirit. Uh, once the New Testament was completed, these, uh, these descriptions of these gifts were still things that were needed. But from that point forward, after the New Testament was completely revealed, those, uh, these abilities were no longer miraculous in their 
uh, origin. It was just a normal uh, need and a normal expression of these, we might still call them gifts. We still need people who teach and preach the gospel. We still need people who are uh, hurt, helping those who are hurting, who are involved in uh, nursing people who are sick. We still need people who are willing to hold up from the front, who are willing to support their brothers and sisters in Christ. We need, still need people who are willing to help. And so here is a, uh, a verse in the New Testament that gives us the idea that this is just a basic part of the Christian life. We're all on this journey and we all need help from time to time. We all need that support and that's what we are here to do for each other. If we wanted to take all of the uses of the concept of help and the examples of where a, a brother or sister helped someone else in the New Testament, and we tried to come up with a definition for this idea based on all of the references in the New Testament, we might say this, that help or helpfulness is anything that we do to help someone else move closer to God. That's going to be our working definition tonight. Anything that we do that moves others closer to God. Joe didn't know I was going to use that definition, but in his prayer he said exactly that. He said, in praying for me and my deliverance of this Message, He said that He might help us so that we can draw others closer to God. And that's exactly what we are doing. That's the way we want to think of help. Anything that we do, no matter if it's the smallest gesture, something that might be overlooked and not even noticed, all the way up to teaching someone the gospel, converting them to Christ, we're moving them closer to God in their lives. And that's the way we're going to think about help in our lesson tonight. That's our working definition. And again, it's based on the references that we find, especially in the New Testament. We're going to ask two questions tonight about our helpfulness. First of all, who should be helpers? What are some examples of the, the groups of people that we see helping others in Scripture? And then how can we help? How can we reach out and support especially from the front, those who are around us. But before we get to those two questions, <clears throat> if we're thinking of helpfulness as anything that moves others closer to God, then let's consider the opposite for a moment as well. What kinds of things then would be unhelpful? What kinds of things that we do or we may be involved in or, or habits that we have that we don't really even give any thought to that either move people further away from God or they have no impact or influence whatsoever. And that's really what we're getting back to here. It's a matter of our influence. These little things that we do, they may not mean a whole lot in the grand scheme of things, but it's exerting an intentional influence on someone else to try to get them to draw closer to God. So what are some things that we might be involved in that are the opposite, that are unhelpful, that push people further away. What about gossip? When we're using our tongues for gossip, we're not helping. We're not intentionally trying to draw other people closer to God. Gossip, lying, the same thing. Any lie that we tell is going to be found out. We have to tell another lie to cover up for the first lie. And then it just spirals out of control. And no one is helped by a lie. No one is drawn closer to God when we deceive or when we cover up the truth. Gossip, lying, any use of foul language, cursing, slang that is inappropriate, taking the Lord's name in vain without thinking, applying the Lord's name to something that is worldly or unworthy of His use. When we use our mouths in this way, when we use our tongues in this way, we're not helping. We're not pushing people closer to God. We're pushing them further away. When we tell dirty jokes, when we share pornography with our friends in electronic uh, devices have made this so easy, uh, I worry for our young people. When we do that, 
It's not helping anyone. It's certainly not helping ourselves. It's not helping our influence. And it's not helping those others draw closer to God. When we're disobedient to our bosses or to our parents, we're not being helpful. When we are ungrateful to anyone for anything, when we refuse to give thanks for something, a gift or a small kindness or sharing a rebuke when it's needed, any ungratefulness draws, uh, pushes people further away from God. But being grateful, saying thank you at every occasion when it is appropriate is just a reason for them to see Christ living in us. And then being unforgiving. If someone has wronged us and we refuse to forgive them, no one is helped. No one is drawn closer to God when we're unforgiving. So we need to think about those things. I want you to consider your own life, maybe some things that you know that you're involved in that are not drawing people closer to God, but are pushing them further away. But that's not what this is about. This is about encouraging us to be helpful, to be helpers, to see helpfulness as a basic foundational part of living the Christian life. Let's look at some biblical examples of people who should be helpers in our lives. First of all, as spouses, that's our job. We are to help our spouse. When we got married, hopefully that was the foundation. That was the that was the the bottom layer of our relationship was we were looking for an individual, a mate that will help us get to heaven. That needs to be the basic foundational principle of our marriages, of our homes, that we are people who are trying to help each other get to heaven. That's the idea that God instilled in marriage when He created Adam and Eve. Uh, that's why the, the phrase help meet is used especially in the King James Version. Genesis 2, beginning in verse 18, The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make and help meet or suitable for him. But the idea was that she is going to help him. Man is not complete by himself. Woman is not complete by herself. We are helpers for each other. That's our original design. And so I want us to think about our marriages about us as husbands and wives. Do we remember that? Are we thinking about that every day? That my job as a husband is to help my wife. Help her get to heaven first and foremost. Help her in any other way to dwell with her according to knowledge. And that my job as a wife is to be that help suitable to him. To be in submission to him. Spouses, we are to be helping each other. We're to be helping each other draw closer to God but we're also be, to be helping each other find that joy and satisfaction in this relationship and in being the father and the mother of our children. Spouses, first and foremost, are to be helpers. But then we also find in Exodus chapter 2 that our leaders are to be those who help us. Moses was, I believe, the greatest leader in the history of mankind. His meekness his strength, his faith in God make him what I believe to be the greatest leader the world has ever seen. As he is fleeing from Egypt in Exodus chapter 2, he's killed the Egyptian and he has come to Midian. Verse 16 says, Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. Here's these women, they're easy prey. They're not going to feed their sheep before we feed ours. But Moses said, that's not right. They're not doing right. Moses stood up and helped them, the daughters of the priest of Midian, and watered their flock. These two verses are a great description of what our elders are to be doing, of what our leaders are to be doing. They are shepherds. They should stand up for the truth. They should... Help those who are in the flock. Help those who are in need. Help us spiritually. That's their job. And they are to water the flock, to see that we are well watered. That's a great description of what our elders are to do. They are our helpers in this spiritual journey. 
And this is a great task. It is the greatest position in not just the church, but really in the world. Serving as an elder in the body of Christ. Uh, one of our presidents, I can never remember who it was. Levi, who was it? Which president was it that was an elder in the church before he became president? Garfield. He said when he was becoming president, I'm stepping down from the highest office in the land to become president. Now, we call the president the most powerful man in the world. But he recognized that in being an elder in the body of Christ is an, is an even higher position. And so our elders, those who are leaders among us, should be first and foremost helpers in our spiritual journey. Those who support us when we begin to get exhausted, when we are beginning to fall down, they are to come and support us from the front. Hebrews 13 verse 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. I'm so thankful for our good elders here. They are great helpers, both to me and I know to all of you as well. All the great programs that we have going on, all the ways that our community is supported and the gospel is preached, they are great helpers. Our, we as spouses should be helpers to one another. The leaders in our congregations should be helpers. And we as brothers and sisters in Christ must be helpers for each other. In Exodus 23... And in Deuteronomy 22, we find out that even if we're at odds with one of our brothers and sisters in Christ, that's the principle here. We know that this is under the, the law of Moses in the Old Testament, but the principle holds true. Even if we are at odds with them, it does not negate our duty, our obligation to help. Exodus 23 verse 5 says, If you see the donkey of one who hates you, lying down under its burden. You shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. Even if it is someone that we hate, someone that has done us no good in the past and we see they're in a need, we are obligated to help. Deuteronomy 22 leaves out that condition about, about someone that we're at odds with, someone that hates us. Deuteronomy 22 verse 4, you shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down by the way and ignore them. You shall help him to lift them up again. There was no argument. There was no excuse. There was no getting out of it. If you see a brother or sister in need, you help. We cannot escape that. That is for all of us. That principle certainly in the life of Jesus Christ carries over into the New Testament. It's not that we can sit back and let the elders take care of it or that's the deacon's work or the preacher's the one who ought to be doing that. These are commandments to everyone who wears the name of Jesus Christ. James 1.27 we know says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the fatherless is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We are, all of us, commanded to be those who minister to those in need. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help in the English standard or support in the, in the in, uh, King James, help the weak, be patient with them all. That's the command. That's, that's a general principle for all Christians. That is not to just elders or leaders or deacons. That is to all Christians. We as brothers and sisters in Christ are to be our helpers for each other. But then, of course, God is our helper. He always is, always has been, and always will be. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, they are in a conflict with the Philistines again. It won't be the last time. It's not the first time. But here in 1 Samuel chapter 7, the Philistines get word. They catch wind. <clears throat> beginning in verse 7, <clears throat> that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah. And so the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. The children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that He will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. 
And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them. And they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came to beth Car. Now we've been through their deliverance from Egypt. <clears throat> we've been through the wandering in the wilderness where God provided the manna and the quail. Their clothes and their shoes didn't wear out. We've been through the period of the judges now. And we're about to come to the moment where they ask for a king. But here God provides deliverance through the prophet Samuel, the last judge. God thunders with a great thundering against the Philistines and they are discomfited and the men of Israel pursue them and smite them. They win this great victory. And verse 12 says, Samuel took a stone and set it between Mezpah and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I've come. That's the line in the song that we sang. Ebenezer means stone of help. Samuel sets this stone up and says, Hitherto, we've come to this point in our history, in our lives. We are as blessed as we are. God just provided this deliverance for us because He is our stone of help. God is always our helper. Even when men fail us, God never will. Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6 let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, I, the Lord is my helper. I shall not fear what men shall do unto me. God is always there for us, even when no one else is. And our verse that really gives us that definition that helpfulness is anything that we can do to draw others closer to God. That, that moves them closer and, and, and deeper in their understanding of Him. James 4 verse 8 where James says, Draw nigh unto God and He will draw nigh unto you. We draw nigh unto God both through our study of His Word. And the more we study, the closer He comes to us. We move together. We draw nigh to God both through study of His Word, through prayer. The more we're praying, the more He's hearing us. The more He'll answer our prayers. We draw nigh to God by doing good, by helping others. When they see that we believe that God is our helper and we then are willing to help anyone else, they're going to draw closer to God as well. Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh unto you. We have helpers all around us. When we're in need, when we're the ones who are about to collapse, are we looking to these sources for help? To our spouse? To our leaders in the congregation? To our brothers and sisters in Christ? Do we go to God in prayer and studying His Word for the help that we need? This help should be there always. Now we aren't perfect like God. Sometimes we fail. But there's enough of us if one person that we, we want to be our helper isn't there right when we need them, that's why God is no respecter of persons. That's why we should all come together and, and form a, a fabric among us so that if one cannot be there, another is there to lift up those who are in need. Who should be our helpers? Here are some biblical examples of uh, those we should be looking to for help, and if we're in those positions, and we all are, we should be the ones doing the help. How then can we help? And again, we're going to look at some biblical examples of ways that we can be of service to those around us. The first we're going to look at comes from Job. Job was a man of patience. He had lost everything. But before his life was stricken with such catastrophe, Job was a great man. He was the most wealthy man of all those of the East, it says at the beginning. Um, but he feared God. And even after he lost everything, he still maintained his integrity. And he describes himself here in Job 29 as one who was willing to help others. But even his friends who came and falsely accused him of sin because these bad things had happened to him, they believed he must have done something wrong. Even they, back in chapter 4, admitted 
that before these things befell Job, he was this kind of person. Job says this about himself in verse 12 of Job chapter 29, Because I delivered the poor that cried and the fatherless and him that had none to help him. The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me. And I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. That needs to be true for all of us. We help by providing what is needful in the lives of those around us. That means that we're going to have to be involved. We're going to have to know. We're going to have to be in contact with each other. We can't be afraid to share, to let other people into our lives and into our homes. Let them see what's going on in our lives. That's what we're here for. That's how we show the love of Jesus Christ to each other. Job says, I was this kind of person before. I'm still this kind of person. And you know, after God restored all of his fortunes at the end of the book doubly, that he went right back to being this kind of person. Providing what is needed is the most basic form of help that we can offer. In Acts chapter 6, we have recently studied, there was a daily ministration, a daily distribution to those widows who were in need. The church had collected those things. The people, the Christians had brought their goods, they had brought land, they had sold things, and they brought the money and laid it down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made to all men as every man had need. They provided for the basic necessities of life. That is how we can help. But that means we have to have our eyes open. We have to have our ears open. And we have to have our hearts open to what people around us are going through. Are you helping? Another way that we can help is by supporting the work that others are doing. Maybe sometimes we know that we're not cut out to be the one who stands in the pulpit. Maybe we'll never be able to be an elder or a deacon, but we can support those who are. And that is every bit as important. In Exodus chapter 17, as the Israelites are coming up out of Egypt, They've crossed the Red Sea, and they're defenseless, really. God is their defense, so they're never defenseless. But the Amalekites look at them as defenseless. They're easy pickings. And so the Amalekites descend upon them in fury, and they're going to just wipe them out, take all of their stuff. The Israelites had spoiled the Egyptians. They were coming out of Egypt wealthy. And the Amalekites thought they were ready for the picking. But... Joshua leads the the men of Israel into battle with the Amalekites. And as long as Moses has his arms up, the Israelites defeat the Amalekites. But when Moses begins to get weary and his hands begin to drop, the Amalekites get the upper hand. So what do Aaron and Hur do? They make a place for Moses to sit so that his arms can stay elevated and they hold his hands up. That's exactly what we're doing for those who are serving, who are working, who are out front leading uh, the evangelistic charge in this world. The supporters are every bit as essential to those who are up front preaching and teaching. Paul had several that he called his fellow helpers. In Romans chapter 16, there are a couple of people that he mentions specifically as fellow helpers. Verse 3, he says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila. We know them, my helpers in Christ Jesus. And this comes from a different word for help in the New Testament from the one we identified earlier. And this word means co-operators or co-workers. But he says, they're my helpers. How would you like to be described by Paul the Apostle as a helper with him? The man who did more to change the world for Jesus Christ than any other human being. If he calls you a helper, you are truly doing something. Then in verse 9, he says, Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. Those who support the work are every bit as essential as those who are doing the preaching and the teaching. You can support. And if you are a supporter, thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for your words of encouragement. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your strength. That's what you provide. That's what you offer. That's the help that you give to others. You're moving them closer to God through your support. Barnabas was that kind of Christian. He was given the name Son of Consolation by the apostles themselves because he was that one who was willing to do whatever was needed. 
He sold land himself and brought it and gave it to the apostles. He was one who went with Paul on his first missionary journey. Barnabas certainly was a supporter. He was a helper. And we need Christians who fulfill that role. Hebrews 12, 12 says, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Those are supporters. That's exactly what Aaron and Hur did for Moses. And that's who we need to be as well. Providing, supporting, and defending each other. Even when we don't like each other, we still defend the truth. We still defend each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. We still know that we're going to spend eternity together. We may not like each other, but we love each other. In 2 Samuel chapter 10, we, Joab did a lot of wicked things. He was not a great man. But here is an occasion where he shows some wisdom. And certainly he had that. It may have been worldly wisdom, may have been military wisdom, but David was served well by Joab. Joab was a bloody man. He wasn't afraid to shed blood and even contradict David's direct orders to refrain from doing so on occasion. Joab's the one who killed Absalom, you'll remember. But here, the king of Ammon has died, and that king was good friends with David. And David sends a delegation to send his condolences to the king's son, who is the new king of Ammon. But that king, the son, believes that David has sent these men to spy out the land. And so he shames that delegation, sends them back. And verse 6 of 2 Samuel 10 says, When the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, they knew what they had done had upset David. And now they're afraid because David is a great military man himself. But he's going to send Joab to fight this battle. The Ammonites preempt David's decision. The Ammonites send their troops ahead and Joab and his brother are leading the army of David. And Joab says to his brother in verse 11, he said, If the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. That's exactly what we do. These are two brothers who are on two different fronts. They're fighting against two separate forces. The Syrians had come to help the Ammonites, and they won't ever again after this. But they're fighting two separate battles. And they say, if you get overwhelmed, let me know and I'll come help you. If I get overwhelmed, I need you to come help me. That's exactly the attitude that we need to have. We need to defend the truth. Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 7, he uses this word defense twice here in Philippians. It's not used very often in the New Testament. And for it to be used twice here in, in the book of joy, the book of Philippians, I think is worthy of attention. Once is in Philippians 1 verse 7, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, he says to the Christians at Philippi, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel... Ye all are partakers of my grace. What he's saying is, I'm here defending and confirming the gospel. And you guys have supported me. You guys are partakers of my grace. And I am thankful for that. I need that. I'm defending the truth. And you guys are my supporters. So both of these ideas that in helping we support and in helping we defend are present here in Philippians 1 verse 7. We provide in, for the needs of those around us. We support one another in everything that we're doing for the cause of Christ. We defend the truth and we defend each other from attacks from the outside. And then helping also is teaching. It means that we are willing to share the truth of what God's Word says with those around us. In Acts chapter 16, Paul has this vision of one standing over in Macedonia and says, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And that's exactly the help that they needed. They needed to Paul to come and to preach to them, to teach to them, to establish congregations in that area. Certainly miracles were going to be done, but that was only to confirm the word that he was teaching. The help that they needed was the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 9, we meet a man whose son was afflicted, and he needed Jesus to heal his son. And Jesus told him, if you believe, he can be healed. And the man cried out, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. 
He needed Jesus to heal his son. But belief, faith comes by hearing the word of God. The miracles that Jesus did were confirming his message as well. And so we help not only through providing those basic physical needs, the staples of life, but we help also by teaching the truth about Jesus Christ to those around us. The power to be more helpful is in the name of Jesus Christ. We've looked this evening at who should be helpers, how we can be helping those around us, and we've looked at some things that are unhelpful. But the theme of our summer series is the power to be, is the great power found in Jesus Christ. Anyone can be helpful. Anyone can do acts of kindness. Anyone can pay it forward. But the power to move people closer to God is found only in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's as if we're wearing a letterman's jacket as Christians with the name of Jesus Christ across the back. I never got a letterman's jacket. I'm kind of jealous about those who did. I know in order to letter in a sport, you had to play a certain number of quarters or a certain number of downs or a certain number of innings or whatever else. There are requirements. There were minimum requirements that you had to meet in order to get your letter. And then when you wore that letterman's jacket, some of you still have them hanging in your closet, you represented your institution wherever you went and whatever you did. When we are baptized into Christ, we put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. That's the idea. Just like we put on a jacket, a suit jacket or a letterman's jacket, we represent the one that we have put on. When we put Christ on in baptism, we're representing His name in everything that we do from that point forward.